1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Thankful to be in the service again tonight. I'm glad to see each one here. If you're visiting with us tonight, thank you so much for coming to be in the service with us. We appreciate you being here very much. I want to begin reading in verse 26, 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter, 20, uh, chapter 17, if I can get that right. 1 Samuel 17, begin reading in verse 26. I'm going to look, uh, we're going to look for a few minutes as David is approaching the battle with the Philistines and uh, the nation of Israel. Goliath has made his proclamation. He's defying the armies of God. And David is presenting and asking this question to so kind of get this picture of this battle that's taking place. Uh, all of the armies against God are on one side, and you have this great champion who is the leader, if you will, of the host of uh, the armies that are defying the Lord, the adversary. And then you have all of the armies, the host of the living God, and David, a young man who is, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for, unlikely to fight, one who would seem to be unlikely to be able to win in this battle. And as we talked about this morning, it seemed to be an impossible situation that this small man could be able to defeat such a great enemy. And that's what we see in Christ as well, and a picture of that in David. Now, I ask a question to begin for a moment tonight. We are missionary Baptists. That means we are to be mission-minded. We are to be considering missions all the time, to be thinking about missions. And so when I mention to you the idea of missions, what comes to mind? If I were to tell you to, that you needed to be doing mission work, What would you believe would be your job description? Because often what we think and what we should be doing are really two different things. Mission work for me often, when I would think about mission work, my mind would go to a couple of different things. It would go to some foreign place in an area where nobody knows me, nobody has any information about me at all, and I would begin to tell them about Jesus. And that's, there's a place for that. I'm not going to say there's not. But that's often the first thing that comes to our mind. Maybe they say, well, you know, interstate farms. Maybe we go to a place in the United States. Maybe we say local missions. That we could go somewhere around here in the neighborhood and begin to try to present Jesus to uh, those that are around us. Mission work always begins within the context, the frame of the place in which God put you. So when we follow uh, the will of the Lord in our lives, there's no doubt in my mind that when I got out of college, the Lord put me at Priority One Bank. And so I was working within the frame of the will of God. And so while it was needful for me to be doing mission work certainly in other areas one of the main areas I need to be doing mission work was in the place in which God put me I was involved in those people's lives they saw me day in and day out and they should have seen Christ in my life day in and day out and I hope that's the case now oftentimes when we think mission work our first mindset is kind of this social image, I guess, this popular image of what mission work is today, and that's not what mission work is. True mission work happens within the, within the wheel of what God has put us and where God has put us in our lives. What does that mean? You parents here tonight, what is your first and foremost goal as a missionary? Where is your greatest mission field? In your house. In your home, that's where it begins. 
to train your children to begin in that in that place in that construct and then to begin to work outward from there most of us can think of family members within our maybe not our intermediate family but from even from outside, from maybe a little further than that, that we could begin to work people. And so the point that I'm making is if you really want to begin to do true mission work for the Lord, begin with the closest people that you know and work out. And begin to work out from there. I want, now I, I'm going to stop with that for a moment, and I hope that begins to make sense as the message goes forward tonight. Let's begin to read 1 Samuel chapter 17. Verse 26, and David spoke to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, so shall, that, so shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And Eliab, the, his eldest brother, heard when he had spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why comest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart. For thou art come down, that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, What have I done? What have I now done? Is there not a cause? And he turned from him toward another, and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. Now, uh, this is kind of the process of David coming to the battle and finding out what's going on. And we see the, uh, the, the kind of the, the, the place of which David is and David's willing to go to battle. So I want you to notice to begin with, really try to apply this to where we're at today, either as a church or as a family. You think of yourselves and kind of put this in perspective in your own life. We're going to get down to a specific thought in here that I believe tonight, what's on my heart, we really need to consider. But for a moment, I want you to notice the context and what's taking place. David, first and foremost, notices that the people are discouraged. And that's the condition of the nation of Israel at this time. They are discouraged in the fight for the Lord. Now, discouragement, I think, sometimes looks a little bit different than what we, uh, at least for me, it looks different than what I have maybe always counted it towards. You know, sometimes I've, I've allowed myself to just see depression and think discouragement. And de de depression and discouragement are, are really two different things. Dis a person can be somewhat depressed about circumstances and yet not be discouraged and a person can be discouraged and not necessarily be depressed. De discouragement is a lack of confidence in the battle. Uh, 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 even from, from you look at it from this perspective, the, the children of Israel have no confidence in their ability to defeat the Philistines. They're completely outdone with what they're seeing. Again, you see this impossible situation and their perspective on it visually. And David's not looking at that at all. David's obviously looking at, well, the Lord can help me do this. And why can the Lord help him do it? He's going back. The Lord helped, delivered the bear. The Lord delivered the lion. Again, you've got those, those two things. So David's confidence is in God. David's not, confidence is not in his abilities. Now all the other, rest of the nation of Israel, they, they have lost confidence completely because they see the man that's standing before them. They see how great he is and they've lost the, their confidence in their ability to win this battle. So what have they done? Again, discouragement is not, they're not depressed and, and they've just stopped because they're depressed. They're stopped and they're discouraged because they don't think they can win. It is too hard. It's too hard. The enemy's too great. He's too much for me. And so that's, that's what they're seeing. And David has come on the scene and 
David's trying to encourage them, and he's asking, you know, what what will be here? What shall be this? What says? What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine? He's asking, and so the you know the people begin to answer and tell him what's going on, and and uh, David's brother then catches him, which is to me, I'll, I'll stop for a moment and kind of notice Eliab's position in 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 how he is and what he's doing with David. So. You, you see kind of the, the condition that David is in. And we see this. We know what's going on here within the hearts of men because we can see that. And the Bible is telling, that, telling us that. David has a true heart in the situation. David is honestly trying to do what's right. David is honestly seeking, and you know, maybe he, to, and no doubt to, to the rest of the people, and all, many of the people that, they're, they're, that are there at this time, David looks like a crazy man to some degree, and, and Eliab said, what are you doing? You know, you have maybe you ever been put in that situation before where you're trying to do what's right, and people are accusing you? His brother called him prideful. And so his brother mistook the confidence that he had in God and mistaked it for arrogance. And so they sort of say, and he's, well, you're, you're being arrogant. Now there's a difference between the two, between confidence in God and arrogance. Arrogance is confidence in self. I've got this. I can do it. I don't have any problem with the matter. Anyway, David is, that's not David at all. David's saying, look, God will deliver this man to me. I can do it because of God. And so David is honestly trying to approach the situation from a godly standpoint with a pure heart. And he's telling them, look, this is, this is an enemy of the Lord. He is, he is forsaken in, uh, the, the armies of the living God. And, and he's standing against the armies of the living God. And God can defeat this man. And so his brother here is just simply accusing him of coming in the wrong spirit and, and just, you know, doing things incorrectly. I love how David, David answers him, and we're going to look at that answer here in a moment, but David answers him and he just continues on. David doesn't fight that battle. And I, 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 I appreciate that about David, and I think that's a good reminder to us that, you know, people are always going to have their accusations about our motives and our purpose. We just need to be sure that we're right with the Lord and that our hearts are right with the Lord and that we're to continue on and do what God's asked us to do in spite of whether people support us or don't support us because oftentimes you'll find that when you're truly trying to serve the Lord, you're often going to find yourself on an island somewhere. People are really not going to support you. And often it's not... I, I think, honestly, probably what's going on here is it's not so much that Eliab really thought David was being naughty and prideful, but more that he was envious that David had enough confidence to go fight him, and he didn't. And so maybe he's a bit envious of David's and what David is, is doing. Now, you take a moment and, 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 and turn back again to the nation of Israel and notice the again the discouragement and they've given up they're they're through they're sidelined they're not going to go out they're not going to fight with Goliath that there's not a man in Israel that would be willing to go out and fight with him and here is this battle here is this this battle that, again, they, that they're looking at and they're allowing fear and they're allowing logic, their understanding of it, that there's, there's no way we can defeat this man. They're allowing that to, to push them into, into uh, the, the, the decision that's already been made because they're sidelined. Their minds are, 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 are in, in other words, in their minds, they're already defeated. And there's no sense in us going out here to fight this man because we cannot win. 
In their own minds, they're already defeated because of a lack of confidence, which of course is their discouragement. And because of all of this, in their minds, they're already defeated. And so there, there's, you know, in their minds, there's, there's no need to go out here and die. There's no need to just walk out there and let this man kill me. I can't win anyway. There's no way I'm going to be able to defeat. And so they're willing to sit back and they're willing to do nothing and they're allowing this man to win the battle and they're not going to do anything about it and by the way remember what happens to the army that loses they're slaves and so these men are choosing slavery for themselves and their families rather than to fight the battle that's in front of them. I want you to hold on to that thought. These people are choosing to be slaves to their enemy rather than fight the battle before them because in their minds the battle is too hard. So David comes along. And David begins to try to encourage them. I want to stop for a moment. Now let's, let's turn this to us. David begins to encourage them. And then David makes this statement, not only to his brother, but to others that were there as well, as you can see in verse 30. And David said, what have I now done? In other words, what am I doing wrong? And trying to build the people up. What, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? Is there not then a, a, a reason, a, a purpose to fight? What, is that, what does that look like for us? Now we, we understand that we're in a spiritual war. We understand all of that and, and a very, find ourselves in a very similar situation in this spiritual war and, and often finding ourselves discouraged because it is a battle that is very difficult. It is a battle that if you are not fighting, you are losing. It is a battle that if you're not fighting, you are enslaved. It's, it's, it's a difficult battle and yet part of the devil's job is to make that battle difficult. And one of the reasons that the battle is so difficult is because we often try to fight in the flesh. And what can we do in the flesh? I don't know if I use this example. I don't think I use the example this morning. But if you go to, you know, a lot, a lot of these carnivals, I may, I may have used it before, but if you go to one of these carnivals, a lot of times they have these big elephants and they'll train these elephants. And you'll find these elephants, while they're not being and participating in, in the carnival, they're just maybe outside. And they'll, they'll have these, rather than putting them in a cage or something of the nature, they would have these elephants just stake down with a short chain and a, you know something around their their leg and a short spike about this big and then you look at that and you're like man they could jerk that thing up and go wherever they wanted to what why are that why are they just staying there they're, they're not they're not even trying to escape and the reason is is because when they were little small they put them on that same stake and when they were little it was impossible for them to pull that up and they pulled and they pulled and they pulled and eventually they were so convinced that they were had no ability to do it that they quit trying they quit fighting and so now they have this little stake holding this humongous elephant and he won't try to get out because he's convinced he's already beat and so often that's what discouragement is for us is we've convinced ourselves that we're already defeated. There's no need in fighting. There's no need in trying to overcome. There's no need in continuing this spiritual war because we're already defeated. There's no way we can defeat this enemy that's in front of us. And yet the devil's, the devil's goal in that is to, again, we're fighting in the flesh and it's just beat us down and couple of times real quick and then we are we're convinced there's no way I'm going to be able to defeat him now turn for a moment and, and look at this even from a, a parent standpoint, uh, standpoint we oftentimes find ourselves as parents that that it just almost there's this desire to just give in because things are extremely difficult as a parent You know, and you, you hear these wonderful, encouraging words all the time that I'm so glad I'm not parenting, you know, raising kids now in these times. Well, that's encouraging. 
It is difficult, but it's not impossible. Because we have the Lord. And no matter how great the enemy is before us, we have the Lord. And the Lord's greater. And the Lord can over, overcome. And, and there's times that it is difficult. Does life ever get busy for y'all? It's busy. Life is busy. I don't like that. I don't like being busy. Honestly, I miss the times where we used to sit on the front porch when I was growing up. And, and you know, and it's evenings we'd ride around in the neighborhood or something of the nature. Maybe we'd just get out and walk. If people were on their front porch, we'd just go up and talk to them. But regardless of what I like and what I don't like, I can't change the fact that it is what it is. So what do we do? That's the important thing. What do we do? Do we give in? Do we stop? It's, again, it, it's, it's hard. It's a fight to get your family together and, and, and try to sit down and have a, a family devotion. It's difficult. It's a fight to, to have prayer time with your family. It's a, it's a fight to have prayer time alone. And these things are difficult fights. And the, the devil is not going to give in with these things because often these things are the most important things. These are the things that give us the, the, the juice, if you will, to keep going through the day, the, the fire to keep moving and to, to overcome things. It's a whole lot easier to get up in the morning and just carry on about your day and not have to get up that extra 30 minutes early or something of the nature to sit down and spend your time in the Word of God. But is there not a cause? Is there not something to fight for? Would we rather just sit on the sideline and be defeated and allow our family to go into slavery? Because that's where they're headed. And you say, well, what, how, how does that take place? Well, just do nothing. And they'll become slaves. That's all it takes. Just give in to the fight. Take the easy road. Do the easy thing as a parent. There are many, many times as a parent, and I, I'm sure I've got a lot to learn in that direction as well. As, as my children grow up and, and read, reach teenage years and, and many things to come that, that are even going to be more and more difficult. But at what point is it you just say, well, I can't fight anymore? When we realize that the fight's not about me. It's not just a, a, a fight that, that I have to fight, but it, it, it's my family that's, in, uh, that's affected as well. By the way, a lot of the discouragement that we face is not just because we think the fight's too hard. It's honestly because we got so bogged down with life we just don't even want to fight anymore. That's what the spiritual war looks like that we face. We've gotten so involved in life. One of the reasons that parenthood is difficult, and by the way, my, my mother used to tell me this. She said, raising children is the most selfless thing you'll ever do in this world. Because you're going to give it yourself. You're going to give it yourself. There's a lot of nights I'd not better be, rather be sleeping. I can't say a whole lot because Chris does more of that than I do. <laughs> but y'all ever get tired and just say, well, I want to go do something for myself? But when is there time? If we're not careful, we can go get and just get to the place that we're so bogged down with that mindset. I want to do something for me. But it's the Word of God that keeps us away from that because that is the dangerous mindset. We're to be training our kids and teaching them. Again, that is, that is the, the greatest mission field that we have is right here around us. It's right in our homes. It's right in front of our faces. 
That we have a mission work that's here. And it's not just, that mission work's not just get some folks saved. That's not it. It's to train them to be good workers for the Lord. But to be strong men and women that are, that are staying to the truth. That are sticking with the truth. And so often it's like, well, you know, we, we get the mindset, well, whether you know this, we we got to keep on Baptist. Well, I'm not worried about keeping on Baptist. I want to keep them with the Lord. That's what's more important. I want to keep them with the truth. Now, tonight I don't think there's a whole lot of separation between the two. But the point that I'm trying to make is that we get more concerned about the name than about the Lord. <laughs> And the doctrine teach them. Why don't we wash feet? And furthermore, when we do to wash feet, do you participate? Is it something that you really believe in? It's amazing to me the landmark Baptists that take pride in the fact that we're foot washing Baptists. They don't show up to communion. That's one of the most important services that we have. That's a, that's a communion, a time that we remember the death of the Lord and what he's done for us. We're too busy to show up. We get so bogged down in life if we're not careful and we're so consumed with what we want out of life that we've lost sight of the war that we're fighting. And the war is more important the war is more important. Our children are more important. And the devil is doing his best to take them captive. And the truth is the only thing that will keep them out of the snare. So what do they need? They need the truth. And they need somebody to teach it to them. They need us. Furthermore, I'll take a moment. I, I, the masculinity is under attack in our world. So that should be something that we're promoting. Again, I made some statements about that this morning, but biblical masculinity is it's something that's extremely important. It doesn't mean you're not fearful. It doesn't mean you're not scared. It doesn't mean that you don't have feelings like everybody else has. It just means that when the time comes, you're willing to stand up and do the right thing. One of the things that frightens me to death about our churches Again, I'm not saying that we're in that condition by any means. Is that we need to be prepared to protect ourselves. Right down the road here, there's a church that in my memory serves me right, 1970, I believe it was. It was called Bible Baptist Church. One day the preacher resigned. And he left the church. And a lady said, look, my nephew just surrendered to preach we could ask him to come and they asked him to come and they said well he believes things a little bit different but it, it, it's not going to be that much let's, let's go ahead and let him come he began to preach at the church and he had some fire in his way to deliver the message and they appreciated that they liked how he spoke not what he spoke so they called him for pastor Shortly, the doctrine of the church began to change. Today, that church is no longer, very short amount of time now, that church is no longer a Baptist church. That church is known as an apostolic church. Just that fast, they fell into false doctrine. Why? Because they didn't know the truth, and they weren't willing to stand for the truth. My job as a pastor that I take very serious is that if God ever calls me away from here, I've left you in a condition that you can protect yourself. And that's not going to happen. And that's something that I take extremely serious. I want you to think about something with me for a moment. Something's been running in the back of my head. And I, maybe it's the Lord preparing me. I don't know what it is for, for whatever reason, but I just felt this in the, just something that the Lord's reminding me of. I, I think, but I grew up under some pretty difficult coaches. I, I liked to play sports, and I had some that were tough. And 
You'd run bleachers playing basketball. You'd run foul poles playing baseball, and you ran. And you ran hard. When I got out of those and I began to play in, in the band, I think I was in the eighth grade when I started playing in marching band. My memory serves me when I probably in eighth grade was about four foot eleven. I was short. I maybe I weighed a hundred pounds. And they put a snare drum on me. I'm about convinced I still got back problems because I carried that snare drum. That snare drum was heavy. And it was a fight to carry that snare drum. And I had to hold it for hours standing in a parking lot. It was not fun. It was difficult. It hurt. But when they put me on that field and I had to play for 20 minutes, that was a breeze because I had held it for hours in a parking lot. We don't like the coaches that are rough but when it comes game time and when it's championship time, we're thankful for the coach that prepared us when the fight's on. We want the coaches that'll be easy to us and not make us run all those laps, not make us do all that work. But what's going to happen when the game time comes? Now look at it from a, 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 a spiritual perspective. When we work, when we put in the effort to sit down and to read the Scriptures, to study when the times are not hard, to study in the practice times, to work within the church and to, 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 to be in tune with the pastor as he's trying to, to, to teach, whether that be me or we're visiting revivals or whatever it is, that, that we're in tune because we, not, not that we're just trying to keep up, but that we're truly trying to understand and to know God's Word. Then when the difficult times come, that we're prepared for the battle, that we're ready for the fight. And there's times that the Lord puts us in times of training to prepare us for what's coming in the future. And those times can be difficult and the Lord can put pressure and those times are to be, as, as we are together, to be training our children because as much as we try to protect them from the world, there's one day we're going to have to let them go and they're going to have to survive in it. And they need to know these things. They need to know the truth. They need to know the truth about what society faces. They need to know the truth about pornography and how just completely awful and destroying it is in your life and in a marriage. It'll destroy you. It'll destroy a marriage. Alcohol. These things, and, and again, it's the things that society faces, not just those things, but the Word of God and, and why we believe in, in these type things. Tonight we need to be prepared. Is there not a cause? I think about Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah made the statement. He, he, he asked them, is there, is there not something to fight for? Think of your sons and your daughters and your, your husbands and wives. Think about these. That there's, there's a reason to fight. Not just for ourselves, but for our families. That's the mission field. Think of them. Think of them. Tonight our, our kids have questions. Questions that we should have the answers to. Questions that we should be prepared to answer. Questions from the Word of God. And sometimes our children can ask us some very difficult questions. And that's not a bad thing. It should provoke us to study. To find the answers. To look, to dig. And that we could be there to help them. And not always just say, this is what you're going to do because I said so. But to say, look, this is what the scripture says. This is the reasoning. This is the, the, the purpose of it. 
So David made that statement to the nation of Israel. Is there not a cause? Is there not a reason to fight? Is there not a reason to, uh, to, to, to fight against the spiritual war that we face? Do we not have something to fight for? So tonight I want you to take a moment and think about those that are around you, those that you are fighting for. And ask yourselves, is there not something to fight for? Is there not something that we could strive more? Am I, am I fighting the fight that I need to fight? Am I doing what I need to do spiritually for their sake? That I could be prepared to fight that fight. Tonight, is there not a cause while well, we have a verse of a song?